really hear it growling from other rooms as we closed off certain rooms. You, it was almost like stereo. You could hear it here, and it was like playing cat and mouse with us. Uh, I mean, we were so exhausted by, uh, by the time 3, 3 a.m. rolled around. Uh, we hear some disturbance going on downstairs. Jason's up there, upstairs with a walkie-talkie. Jason, it's going down, down here. What do we do? And he just goes, chill. <laughs> <laughs> At 3 and 4 in the morning, things seem a little less scary. Right, yeah. <laughs> I mean, we, you know, we've been up we'll be scared tomorrow. Two nights, you know, and, uh, yeah. Yeah, we've been up a long time. Jody Picoult was with us that night. Um, Jody Picoult, who was the author of Second Glance, and uh, she did do research with us for that book. And part of her uh, research does appear um, that she did in that night in that house. Anyway, uh, finally I pronounced uh, an expulsion, and I asked uh, for a sign of its expulsion. There was a 200-pound parrot cage downstairs with a parrot in it. Again shaking almost like an earthquake began moving across the floor then stopped and then there was kind of a feeling of peace uh the parrot survived by the yeah oh, yeah. <laughs> the parrot survived. yeah yeah no, no animals were armed or anything. <laughs> yeah. but this gets to a case of following through see we can uh go in bless a house uh do an expulsion but you know it's it's up to the family to keep things in an atmosphere, a positive atmosphere. I'm not saying everything has to be perfect, like um, you know, like a TV family or something like that. Everything's leave it to Beaver, but uh, everybody has daily crisis, daily concerns. But basically, keeping an upbeat avenue, upbeat attitude. Uh, the old adage of family that prays together stays together. Well, this family called us back several months later. They were having disturbances again, so we came back in October. Why were they having disturbances? Well, the family had not, you know, kept their end of the deal, so to speak. They, um, one of the teenage daughters came home drunk. She had a bunch of friends with her that were, uh, you know, really creating a ruckus and everything. And apparently, this was going on quite a, quite a bit. And uh, there are certain entities that will feed off negative en en energy. They, they literally feed off it. They're very parasitic and uh, just as they feed off fear they'll feed off any kind of negative emotion so uh, you know we have to tell this family you're actually feeding these these entities you want them gone but you have to do your part you have to really really want them gone enough to make a major change in your life so that's um, why the disturbance started all, all over again and uh, unfortunately one of our members lost quite a bit of money that night it was stolen from from their wallet and you know we're there to help people and they have all these Teenagers just out of control. That, that's, I'm just bringing this up. That's a situation that shows how things can get out of control, and it is up to the family. That's why we often, uh, almost always, stay in touch with the family afterwards, if at all possible, to see how you're doing, how's things going. You know, it's been uh, three weeks since we've been there. How are things? Are things still calm and quiet? So, and before we take some uh, questions, I'd like to just uh, describe a case that tells what happens, what can happen, when you confront a demonic presence, you know, when you try to, to do battle with it, so to speak. Uh, this was in the late 1970s, and in the early 1980s. There was this family with whom I was friends, and they had a boy who seemed to be suffering a case of severe demonic possession. They knew I was a paranormal investigator, so they asked for my assistance. I stayed overnight in the family's house to observe him. The boy was at the time 13, and this happened from the time he was 13 until he was 14 years of age. Uh, I heard he was having spells, episodes, that did not seem to be quite psychological, at least not completely. So I stayed overnight. One in the morning. They said he usually had his episodes between one and two in the morning. Okay, it's about five after one in the morning. All of a sudden, we're all awakened by this terrible shrieking. I mean, screaming, uh, like he was in terrible pain. Uh, I turned on the lights, and I've got all my presence of mind. That's what I'm here for to, to analyze this situation. All of a sudden, this young boy comes out of his bedroom, spinning around on the floor like a top in a way that accelerated motor performance just doesn't explain. He was careening off the walls and screaming all during this time. 
and just banging real hard against the walls, like he was being thrown. Then he jumped up on a bed and started, you know, he had this demonic laugh uttering from him. It, it just it seemed like it was coming from another realm. And uh, I tried to restrain him. I was about 200 pounds at the time. I was in fairly good physical shape. This was a 13-year-old boy. I tried to pin him down. He just bent my arms right back. So then the episode passed, and he, he was not acting. I mean, I don't see how he could have moved like that anyway, but he was, he was terrified. These episodes had been happening for months, and they were worsening. So an exorcism was planned where clergy was brought in. I attended. Uh, participants were seated in a semicircle. Uh, an altar was set up with a bowl of holy water. And a member of the clergy was present. Uh, at the beginning of the, he, he was seated there, the young boy, his name was Lucas. He was a little nervous, but he was seated there quite calmly. Then the exorcism began. Something happened I can't describe with words. The air became thick, something changed. Then the floor rumbled as if a truck was going by or as if there was an earth tremor, but there wasn't, it wasn't, couldn't be attributed to any of those of the, the floorboard shook, rumbled, audibly. Then my chair, with me in it, moved back across the room into the wall. I mean, I was like, I just realized what happened about a second into it. They're like, I'm moving back across the wall and nobody, I thought somebody was pulling me, nobody was. My whole chair with me in it just moved back across the wall. Then the boy fell to the floor and started writhing into these terrible convulsive-like movements. So the exorcism altogether, there was one horrend horrendous scene after the other that night, and endured for about an hour. At one point, I felt something invasive. I felt this onrush of emotion that was alien to me, this anger, this distress, but not, not coming from within my own mind, it seemed. Just overtaking me, telling me to do wild things, telling me to be violent. You know. uh, I resisted it. I just concentrated on my own sense of being, you know, my own sense of presence. And having resisted it, it seemed to, like a vacuum in the back of my head, it seemed to pull away from me. And I felt this, this unearthly tingling in the back of my head. It seemed to pull out of me and the emotion left with it. Instantaneously, it went to a girl who was in the next room who was present. She started to scream and pull at her hair. So it seemed to transfer from me over to her. Well, to wrap it up, I could tell one horrendous thing after the other that happened that night. I'd just uh, like to mention that uh, we're sitting in a semicircle. Oh, Keith was there. Right, yeah, we're sitting in a semicircle. It seemed to be going from one person to another in a counterclockwise method. So uh, that's that's another indication. I like it's to think things I... that are inhuman will usually tend to go counterclockwise, go backwards. I like to think I do have my presence of mind in such instances that my analytic mind will take over, my objectivity. But even after all these years, I still, I still feel a tremor when I remember how that boy was just spinning around that room. Yeah. Well, the exorcism did seem to be successful. Not in a dramatic finalization, but he did have another episode where his family was driving by a church and he started to shriek and scream. Uh, but after a while, it just subsided. It just faded away was gone by the, before he reached his 15th birthday. We never know. We never knew what brought it in. He didn't have any history with a Ouija board or anything that you might guess. It just came, and then it left. Actually, I think I have an explanation why it came in. This boy, his family, uh, their religious practice was Santorian. I don't know if anybody here is familiar with Santorian. Very odd. Uh, somewhat similar to voodoo in a lot of ways. Uh, well, this boy had been walking with his family through a cemetery. He happened, when he was a young child, he happened to see a glove lying in the cemetery grounds. He just picked it in. Now, we don't know where the glove came from. It could have been used in some kind of profane worship ceremony. He picked it up. He felt something was with him. He felt something attach itself to him. That night, he told me that he saw a crazy old man, crazy looking old man, come into his room and tell him, you're mine, you belong to me now. And this spirit seemed to harass him throughout his uh, young years. And then when he uh, reached the age of 13, it started happening again, where he actually started, this spirit started taking over him. And he had no memory of when he was going through these episodes. So 
that might be one explanation. Yeah, that, that, that was so innocuous even I'd forgotten about that. That was kind of, yeah. you know, at the time we didn't think much of it, but later on in reflection, we yeah. thought that might have uh, engendered this, this problem we had. All right, if we could just take a few questions, then we'll move on to the next portion of the yeah. talk. Well, actually, Carl, we were going to... Uh, You're going to go right to the... Yeah, yeah. and we, we can questions do the... Questions at the end. I yeah, think we can do questions the at the end. Okay. Hopefully you'll have even more questions at the end. <laughs> well, hopefully you will. Build up. Yeah, because we got a little later start than we expected anyway. So we'll move on to the second part of our presentation, if we could. Keith's going to tell something of Vampires of New England, the truth behind the legends. How many of you have heard of Vampire Legends of New England? Right. Usually people who, who live around here have heard about them. But, uh, hey, class, the classic fictional vampires. You've heard of Dracula. Of course, everybody knows about Dracula. He was portrayed by Bela Lugosi, published in 1897 by Bram Stoker. Isn't he king of the vampires? Well, some people think so, but yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 He, is, he is based uh, on uh, Vlad Tepes, which of course Vlad the Impaler of Romania. And um, here's a scene where Dracula's brides are pressing down the marker. And this is a way to uh, dispatch of a vampire, <coughs> pounding a wooden stake through the heart, thereby pinning the soul so it can no longer rise. Now, the truth in New England first case, first known case, famous case we know of, was Rachel Harris in 1794 in New Hampshire. I'm in Vermont, I'm sorry, Vermont. That's actually the place in Vermont. Um, where a woman had died, the husband was remarried, and uh, supposedly the belief was the first wife was coming back in spirit form, actually sucking the life force out of the second wife. And uh, so he had her body exhumed, had the uh, coffin lid opened. I guess her body was in a relatively good state of preservation because what they did was look for the incorruptible. They could find the body in a state of incorruption. That proved that a demonic vampire spirit was living in this body, using it as a host. and. Uh, draining the life forces out of uh, another person. Usually the disease would be tuberculosis, or what they then called consumption, because it would consume the victim and they'd waste away. Uh, well, the body of uh, Rachel Harris was, uh, her heart was removed, her uh, chest was cut open, her heart was removed and burned. There were over, well over uh, 200 witnesses to this. Practically all of the town turned out at the time. So that shows it was not a hidden practice at the time. Stephen Staples, 1796, Cumberland, Rhode Island. His daughter had died and was supposedly coming back from the dead. They had her body, Stephen Staples obtained a court order to have her body disinterred so that he could, quote, try an experiment, unquote. He was granted this permission by the town council uh, with the stipulation that he give his daughter a decent reburial afterwards. And uh, Sarah Tillinghast, very, very well-known case in Rhode Island, took place in 1799, where Snuffy Tillinghast, he was called Snuffy because of the snuff-colored jacket he wore, had a large apple orchard, and he had uh, his wife, Honor Tillinghast, and bore him a, lar a large family. He had many children. He actually had uh, 12 children at the time. His eldest daughter, who was still living at home, was uh, in her early 20s at the time. It's a very, very beautiful young woman. However, um, one night, Snuffy Tillinghast had a dream where half his apple orchard had died, and he smelled a uh, scent of decay on the wind, and the other half remained very healthy and thriving. And he heard his daughter, Sarah, calling to him on the wind. Well, when he awoke, he wondered what this disturbing dream had meant. Shortly, this is the uh, Tillinghast uh, Cemetery in Exeter, Rhode Island. Shortly after, Sarah became ill, began complaining of chest pains. Um, she then began uh, coughing up uh, bright red spittle, 
and, which was hemorrhaging from the lungs. She was diagnosed it with consumption. Unfortunately, a few weeks later, she died. Shortly after, another child became sick and began complaining of the same symptoms. However, there was a difference. This second child complained that my sister Sarah comes in my bedroom at night and sits on my chest and makes me hurt. And uh, that child died too. Three more children died and uh, they all complained that Sarah was coming into their home, into, into the room rather, and uh, sitting on them, making them hurt. And uh, so they consulted at the local town Grange what was going on. Snuffy talked about his dream, and pretty soon it was prophesied that his dream was interpreted that half of his family was going to die, destined to die, just like he dreamt half his orchard was going to die. His orchard symbolizing his livelihood, his family. So much as he regretted it, in uh, December of 1799, uh, the whole nation was actually in mourning because we just lost the father of our country, George Washington. He came with some farm hands and friends of the family. They set about the task of disinterring the children. Uh, first few children were well into decomposition. However, when they came to the body of Sarah, who had been buried the longest, they were in for a shock because she seemed to be an incorruptible. She was very lifelike. Her skin was very ruddy. Her eyes were wide open and staring. Her lips were parted into a smile. And uh, so they were very sure that they had found their vampire. Of course, now we know there are actually medical um, explanations for the condition of her body, depending on the air tightness of the casket. The body will sometimes become very ruddy, and, and uh, because the skin tends to contract, it makes it actually look as if the hair and the fingernails have grown, and which was probably why her mouth was pulled back into a smile and her eyes were open. This is actually her, her modest headstone, Sarah Turing has a mod, mod, modest headstone. Well, her father, much as he regretted it, pulled open her burial shroud, took out his carving knife, plunged it into her chest, took out her heart. When he did so, Many of the onlookers were splattered with what appeared to be fresh blood. Cut out her heart, burned it in a campfire they set right in the middle of the cemetery, and the ashes were blown away in the wind, and they reburied the bodies. Now, Anna Tillinghast had also recently become sick and uh, complained that her daughter Sarah was visiting her. After uh, the exhumations, one more child died, was very an advanced uh, illness anyway. Honor Tillinghast did recover and she bore her husband Snuffy two more children. So that is the legend of Sarah Tillinghast. There is some uh, paranormal activity supposedly associated with her grave. Um, next we have Nancy Young in the year 1827, Foster, Rhode Island. It was the same thing. She was a 19 year old farm girl. Her father, Colonel Levi Young, consulted that uh, other family members were becoming sick and dying. Well, what's the thing to do? The thing is to disinter the bodies, look for the incorrupt incorruptible. Now, uh, Nancy Young, see it's a very, very rural, overgrown cemetery. Nancy Young was disinterred. She was found to be in a remarkable state of preservation. However, instead of simply cutting out the heart and burning it, in this case, Colonel Levi Young, I don't know where he got this idea from, but he had her body burned right there at a funeral pyre right in the cemetery. He instructed his family members, his wife and his children, to gather around the body as it was burning and inhale the fumes, start breathing in the smoke, thereby inoculating themselves against further attacks, then her remains were reburied. Unfortunately, uh, two more children died and uh, two others uh, did live on to, to uh, live full lives. So this is outside the cemetery. Elisha Ray, this is in Jewett City, Connecticut, in 1854. Again, uh, family members were repeatedly dying. Two brothers, Elijah Ray and his brother, were actually disinterred and their bodies burned right there in the cemetery. We don't know if uh, family members inhaled the fumes, but uh, this, seemed, this time it did seem to work because no more family members died after that. They were sure they had found their cure. This is, uh, the gravestone of Elijah Ray in Jewett City. Now, the Rose family, this is in Peacedale, Rhode Island, in 1874. William Rose, very prominent citizen of the area, 
His daughter, Ruth Ellen Rose, died at age 15. Sometime after she, after she died, uh, her spirit was supposedly coming from the grave and family members did report seeing her. His first wife died, uh, William Rose was remarried. They decided to disinter her body. William Rose uh, disinterred her body, cut out her heart, burned it on a nearby rock. Now, where did he get this idea from? His second wife's maiden name was Tillinghast. Her great-grandfather had been a brother of Sarah Tillinghast. So we can only speculate where he got that idea from. This is the Rose Family Cemetery. Uh, unfortunately, nobody knows, that's the gravestone of William Rose, nobody knows where Ruth Ellen Rose is buried, apparently. They thought because of the controversy surrounding her death and exhumation that maybe she didn't deserve a headstone, which I think is very sad. But, uh, nobody knows where she's buried to this day. This is a nearby grave of Juliet Carter Rose, who uh, is often mistaken for uh, Ruth Ellen Rose, but her name was actually, because of the uh, proximity, but her name was actually Ruth Ellen Rose. Mercy Brown, the most famous and by far my favorite. Mercy Brown is uh, the most well known. This is the Chestnut Hill Baptist Church in Exeter. George Brown was a prominent farmer and horse trader. In 1883, he lost his wife, who was 37 years old, to consumption, tuberculosis. Six months later, the uh, eldest daughter, age 20, Mary Olive, succumbed to the same disease. He had uh, three other children. Now this is um, the this is where uh, his eldest daughter is buried, Mary Olive Rose. Now uh, his son, several years later, Edwin, was the pride and joy of the family since he was the only son. He began showing the symptoms of tuberculosis. He was very husky, robust fellow, when he began wasting away, coughing up the bright red spittle. He was sent out to Colorado Springs for recovery, which uh, the mineral water there uh, did seem to have some uh, curative effect. How, how, how many, by the way, saw the uh, episode at the Stanley Hotel, the uh, season finale? Oh, good, uh, almost everybody here. Yeah, that's right, yeah. Now, you notice uh, that they said uh, Stanley himself was sent out to Colorado Springs to drink of the mineral, mineral water. And he totally recovered and he recommended it to other people. The same thing with Edwin. Edwin, um, young man of age 21, did go out there with his young wife and he did recover for a while. He seemed to be recovering. Uh, during this time, his sister, Mercy Lena Brown, also contracted the disease. She had the galloping form of it, meaning she wasted away very rapidly. She died at age 19 on January 17, 1892. Because the ground was frozen, she was actually, her body was not buried right away. It was placed in this holding crypt right here. It's still in the Exeter Cemetery. Edwin had a uh, severe relapse, and he realized he, he wasn't going to be around that much longer, so he came back to spend his last month with his family and his friends. Now, because of the blight that was striking his family in uh, 1891 and 1892, they had a, a grange, of course, all prominent farmers belonged to. It was like a lodge, the grange, very similar to Masonic's. And they held a meeting as to how they were going to help uh, George Brown deal with this affliction of cooking his family because his uh, eldest son was on, his only son was on death's door. So the Grand Master of the Grange apparently suggested a cure for him, told him about the process of disinterring the bodies of family members looking for the incorruptible. Uh, very interestingly, the Grand Master of the Exeter Grange at the time was Mr. William Rose, who had dealt with the situation himself. So apparently he gave the idea to George Brown. Now, if you read on a lot of stories about Mercy Brown, you'll read that uh, George Brown dug up his daughter in 1892 and and dug up his family. Actually, that, that is not true. Uh, George Brown didn't actually believe in this superstition or folklore, but he was desperate to save his son and they talked him into it. He simply paid to have it done. Now, interestingly, that uh, they went to the county medical examiner, 
Dr. Harold Metcalf. This is another thing you read, it. old Dr. Metcalf. Actually, I looked him up, he was only 32 at the time. But he was the county coroner and medical examiner. He was consulted, and at first, of course, he, he didn't believe that uh, this was actually a spirit, spiritual disease. By this time, most of the medical exam, uh, establishment did know what tuberculosis was and why it was caused, although they really couldn't do anything about it at the time. But because he was paid to uh, intervene, he finally agreed, and he went to the cemetery on March 17, 1892. The bodies of uh, the mother and daughter, Mary Eliza Brown and Mary Olive Brown, were disinterred. Mary Eliza Brown was very much decayed. She was basically in a state of partial mummification. The heart was still there, but it was just a dried lump of flesh. So um, obviously she was not the vampire they were looking for. Then um, Mary Olive, the daughter, was completely a skeleton except for a long growth of hair. So there was no heart available. Next they came, they disinterred Mercy Lena. Then they got their shot. Not only was she perfectly preserved, she had also rolled over in her grave. So she was actually in a partial sleeping position. They were convinced that uh, they found the vampire. Uh, as ghoulish as may seem now, Harold Metcalf performed the autopsy right here in the holding crypt. Her heart did contain quite a quantity of blood. Her liver was removed, that contained blood too, and her lungs were removed as well. He himself saw nothing strange about her level of preservation. You have to remember she was buried in the uh, above ground in the two coldest months of the year. However, after he left, the people, uh, 12 men who had assisted, were very convinced that they had found the vampire spirit and the body was inhabiting. What they did was take her internal organs, which had been removed, her heart, her lungs, and her liver. They burned, it, burned them on a nearby rock which can be seen today, which is right near the graves. And uh, they buried the other two, and later on, Mercy herself was buried. And what they did, they took the ashes from these internal organs, mixed them in water, gave them to Edwin to drink. So he actually did consume the ashes of his sister's internal organs. Um, he said she was in a very, very uh, good state of preservation. Unfortunately, Edwin died on May 2nd, less than two months later, in 1892. But they figured he was too far gone, and because no deaths occurred afterwards, they felt they'd done the right thing. However, this, this brother, um, Edwin and his wife, Hortense, died right there. However, this time, because the, it was a late date, 1892, and the county medical examiner had been involved, it leaked out to the Providence Journal and made headlines and they were, they called them basically a bunch of superstitious fools looking for the undead in cemeteries, so it did put a stop to the practice. Um, Mary, uh, Mercy, rather, is the uh, most popular of the vampire stories. Her stone was actually stolen at one point, and uh, in the early 1990s, you can see it's, they did get it back, and it's, you got a steel band around it so it cannot be stolen again. And uh, unfortunately, she has no epitaph, no religious writings, because I guess you know the controversy surrounding her death and exhumation. There is supposedly is paranormal activity that goes on in this cemetery. People would uh, claim to see strange blue orbs floating around. I myself have been there many times and never seen this at night, but uh, some people do claim they have seen this. George Brown lived to be uh, 80 years old, ripe old age. Now, uh, in 1897, as I said, Bram Stoker published the novel Dracula. When he died in 1912, his wife went through his belongings. She found among his papers a uh, newspaper clipping relating to uh, Mercy Brown, the Mercy Brown case. So he'd obviously done research uh, uh, the wrong case of Mercy Brown for his story. Nellie Bond is a case of the vampire that never was, a uh, case of mistaken identity. In, uh, supposedly this happened Nobody knows exactly what happened, but uh, the story goes that around 1967, a Coventry, Rhode Island high school teacher told her class that a 19-year-old vampire woman is buried along Route 102. And uh, on Halloween night, the students went searching for this vampire, and they went to the they went in the opposite direction along 102. They went down Plain Meeting House Road in West Greenwich, Rhode Island. 
they searched through a creepy looking cemetery they came to, and uh, eventually they came upon a stone which read Nellie L. Vaughan, died at age 19 years. And what really got to them was the inscription on her gravestone, which read, I am waiting and watching for you. Now, they were convinced this was the vampire, even though they didn't have a name. Obviously, the teacher was referring to Mercy Brown, but uh, 